And I'm super excited to talk about uh, some of the recent work on um, some notable challenges of the building machine learning in the wild. So as we, as we all know, machine learning has uh, dramatically revolutionized the field of therapeutic discovery in the recent years. Yeah, many exciting uh, works. But things, this is a vast field. There's just still so many exciting uh, new opportunities and challenges that still face today. So in this talk, I'll talk about uh, three main areas that face challenges. Like first is some a normal therapeutic task, which I will highlight our recent clinical trial um, work. And then I will talk about three challenges in deploying the real world therapeutic machine learning. And also I will highlight uh, the challenges on the in, in infrastructures and data set and benchmarks uh, in therapeutic ML. So let's get started. I'll, I'll uh, first talk about the clinical trial uh, work. So, so uh, for some um, basic background, after we have some uh, promising lead for the drug, we will go through a series of trials uh, to test the, the safety and efficacy. So phase one, we mainly, mainly test about the safety. It has a very small number of, of patients. And the phase two, a larger group of patients and to evaluate safety and, and efficacy. And phase three is a, uh, as a, a larger than phase two, and then it's to try to confirm benefit and safety of treatment. And the, each of these phases would, would incur a huge amount of cost. Like phase one, phase two is like tens of millions of dollars. And it, and it also takes mil, uh, many years. And it, they also um, has very extremely low success rate. So the natural question for machine learning folks to come in is like, if we can predict the trial outcome before the trial starts, right? Given some accessible information about the trial, such as the drugs, the disease, and the, the trial uh, protocols. The benefit of this model is that if it can save patient time, since the patient time is valuable, and then it can avoid skyrocketing costs. And it also, um, if we know a trial is doomed to fail, then we can improve resource allocated to a more uh, to a trial that are more likely to succeed. So, as a more machine learning formulation, uh, it is given lots of information about the trial. We want to predict if the trial outcome is going to succeed or fail. So, this is this this work is led by Tian Fan and uh, joint work with Danica Lucas Jimon. So, the 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 main issue with the clinical trial outcome data is like there's no uh, public data. And uh, each trial is required to be registered at the clinical trials.gov, and it is comprehensive but super messy. And also, the trial outcome label is not available; it is usually uh, proprietary. So this become barriers to build any machine learning model. So, so in this work, we mainly try to introduce a, a new benchmark uh, or, or like new public data set called TOP, that is trial outcome prediction. So basically, we we get from uh, some so, so we, we mine through the clinical trials to uh, to mine lots of information. Like for we have from three hundred and seventy k trials, we get a series of filters that it has to be interventional. It has to be small molecules since we're focusing on on small molecules right now, and uh, and it has to be completed and uh, has um, some label. Uh, you know, in our Acuvia collaboration. And then you also have drug molecule structure and disease code. So that left us uh, around 17K trials. And this was, so to construct a realistic split, so all the uh, completion date in the, in the training set has to be before the start date of any trial in the testing set. So that leaves a lot of these overlapping trials out. So that further reduced the number of trials to 12.5 K trials in use in our um, experiment. So for each trial, we will have this information. First is the drug SMALI string and um, the disease ICD-10 code, and also the eligibility criteria from the protocol, which basically measures what, what, what does the patient population uh, look like um, for this trial. And for the trial outcome, which is you know mainly uh, private, we curate uh, but we uh, from we're collaborating with Acuvia, we have a, a, a manually collected a set of uh, labels for these 12.55K trials. 
So here's some data statistics about this uh, benchmark. Uh, we have around, uh, so it's, it's covering a lot of drugs, a lot of diseases, covering all of these disease groups system, uh, disease groups, and also has from 2000 to 2021. And it also covers one, two, three, uh, phase one, two, three. So, so, so given this um, data source, we kind of trying to build the, uh, like a machine learning model. Uh, basically the intuition for this model is we try to uh, imitate lots of uh, the decision factors for a trial to succeed. So, you know, like uh, the trial has to, you know, the drug has to be good, safe, safe and efficacious. The disease uh, also have, we have, um, also uh, have some like historical information about the disease risk and uh, some protocol information and how these factors are interacting with each other, you know, their fitness um, in, in, a, in a sense. Um, and also uh, there's a, you know, automatic property is one of the leading cause of trial and attrition. So also have, we also needed some representation about the drugs and uh, ADMVT profile, like the pharmacokinetics and how they kind of interact with each other to to form the PK uh, profile. And, uh, and then also like, all, how do we combine, fuse all of this information together to um, do to as the final trial representation. And then we just feed it into a decoder to predict the outcome. Question, so, regarding, the, yeah. the data, regarding the data set, yeah. uh, Professor mm -hmm. Joshua is asking uh, that, he's saying that he did not understand the start and and, and completion date mm -hmm. constraint. Do you mind going back to that in this anymore? more? Yes, yes. So, so, so we, we basically just want to uh, uh, filter. So, for, so we have, we have um, so we have all of these uh, um, trials, and then we want we want to make sure that the start date in any of the test set trial is um, after. The completion date of any uh, training trial, so that there's no uh, leakage of information. Um, okay, since it's sense. a trial, okay. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Yeah, and then so 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 the way we fuse this this data is to um, is is through a graph neural network. So basically, we for each node we initialize with some knowledge about this uh, in the in the in the, in the trial. And then we uh, apply a graph neural network on, on top of it. And then the final representation of this trial node is used to uh, predict the outcome. So, so here, here, here are some um, initial results. Um, so we compare with, so there's no known work for, the, for this uh, the data set. So we just build a uh, benchmark for ourselves. So this is uh, you know, some um, a basic, uh, Machine learning approach, and then also compare with two two deep learning based models um, that are using uh, that that was designed for uh, trial and patient matching problem. So we borrow the uh, architecture and adding the ne necessary information. So this is a phase one trial, and um, yeah. So here's the uh, performance. It, it it is better than the um, baselines, but it still has lots of place to space to improve. And this is also phase two trials. It has similar um, performance as the phase one trial uh, and uh, also better in, in across all metrics. And phase, phase three trials uh, has, has, has better performance. Um, also consistently better than the baseline. And, the, the, and they also have some case studies. Um, so to, so uh, as, we, as I said in the introduction, we try to want to um, identify trials that could be a major flops so that we can improve the resource allocation. So we were able to find some cases that are indeed true. Like, so here are some uh, major um, trials that cost millions and uh, has lots of time and uh, it was predicted to be failure um, with, with some uh, low pro uh, probability. And we're also to able to identify some of the success story. So, 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 so that is the like I want to highlight this new uh, novel therapeutic task, and that is um, that can be of uh, great um, usage for machine learning in the in the, in the future. So, so, so next um, I'll talk about. 
one question in the channel. Uh, Emmanuel Nuta is asking uh, if you have any insight ab about uh, performance improvement from phase one to phase three. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I, think, I think the main... Mm -hmm. I guess okay. the, the question from, from Emmanuel is coming from the fact that if you can predict earlier phase uh, uh, more accurately than, than um, the other phases, that, that we have more... Uh, more impact than just if the, the performance are almost the same. Yes, yes, definitely. I mean, I mean, because uh, as you can see, phase one and two is is much harder than phase three to predict because there's no there's not not much uh, information, um, and uh, because because phase, phase three we already um, know a lot about the phase two and and uh, and, and the phase one information, so it's conditional on that information, so it's. It's much easier, but as you can see, phase two. If we condition on phase one, which is only about, you know, a very small number of participants with uh, some uh, early, early signals, so it's, so it's still pretty hard for phase two predict to predict. And phase one, there's no conditions, conditional information, so it's the hardest. Uh, okay. Uh, one more question. Um, Lun is asking, uh, which disease group uh, the model works well for uh it seems that it yeah. doesn't work well on cancer and rare disease uh, that's an interesting point yeah yeah i, I think, think i yeah i, I think we, we have some like uh, stratification result uh for these four disease groups right but i didn't include in the slide i can i can send to you guys later yeah, I, I forgot which one has the best performance uh, yeah um yeah, so Theodore is asking, um, phase one trial might be more random anyway, uh, because they are smaller. Like, I guess this coming from the fact that phase one results are where the, the worst among uh, all the three phase. Um, that yeah. do do anything to, to account like for that, maybe include some patient data or whatever. Uh, yeah, I think that that's, that's interesting. And I think that's like more of a, future work. So currently we're just including information that is super accessible for any trial. Like, okay. like before recruiting any patient, your patient recruitment is also super expensive and, and everything. So okay. currently we're only just using this three available information and also some representation about the ADMAT properties and the okay. disease risk. Yeah. Okay. Uh, do you know if for some of those uh, um, trials that you have, at least, or do we include the information about if they do the recruitment of a patient based on a biomarker or like those kind of information? Do we include that in the uh, in the data for prediction? Um, currently, no. Yeah, I okay. think I think that that requires some data linking um, to external resources. I, I think that would be feasible because we have disease information, we have ICD nine code, and we can link to some public database about some known biomarkers and or, or even grounded by a more large complex biological knowledge graph that could potentially improve performance. Um, but currently I think we are just trying to establish this uh, initial um, work, yeah. Uh, I think you are muted. Uh, yeah. I Arushi is asking uh, to explain hint again. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, so hint basically, so we first will have some representation for each of the node. So for some drug, we, ha we are using like graph neural network or representation of the on a molecular structure. In the disease, we're using uh, some hierarchical um, encoding about the ICD-10 code because ICD is like a disease ontology. And the protocol will use the uh, eligibility criteria uh, representation uh, output from the clinical bird. And then we, for this blue nodes, we will train a model based on this in individual uh, uh, input representation. So for the drug, we were trying to predict a uh, absorption, distribution, targets and execution and, and toxicity and use the latent representation as the initialization um, of each node. And the disease risk, we're also trying to predict the disease risk from the, the disease embedding and take the recent representation 
as the initialization of this blue node. And then the and, and then interaction is in, initialized as you know like the comp, uh, the the sum of, of of these three nodes. And, and similarly for the uh, this two yellow node, this is also um, sum of the ADMET nodes and the sum of the disease risk and interaction node and trial prediction is the sum of PK and augmented interaction node. So that's the, it, the initialization for the graph neural network. And then GNN is basically used as like a data fusion scheme. Uh, we try to blind in all of these embeddings by propagating uh, this initialization that is meaningful. And then the final embedding from the trial prediction node is used as a representation for the trial. It is then fit into a decoder to predict the uh, trial outcome. Uh, is a um, explain for the roof. Yeah, I think that's great. Uh, thank you. Okay. Yeah, and also, also feel free to um, see our papers in the, for more details. Okay. So so next I'll talk about um, uh, some challenges in the in the deployment. So basically, we all know that biomedicine is all about new phenomena. Right? So it's not we're we're not interested in. Uh, predicting some known things, or well, it's interested in discovering a uh, new phenomena. And that this new phenomena is usually um, out of distribution and also low data. So here are three examples, like the ADMAT uh, prediction, where we have some known chemicals, but during deployment, uh, if we have some client in pharma, the pharma has its own chemical space. So how do we you know, generalize uh, to this new chemical space. And also the pharma library is usually relatively smaller compared to all of the known chemicals in the public space. So, so, so that, that, that becomes a um, kind of auto distribution and a low data problem. And, the, and another issue is a, 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 another example is from a cell type annotation for the tissues, right? If you want to annotate some uh, brain tissue, some, uh, uh, if you want to annotate uh, some, some new cells in the bone tissue and we want to leverage information from the brain and lung tissue, how do we kind of generalize to this novel tissue with only a few labels available? And also uh, for all diseases, right? For example, drug repurposing. Um, we have shown great results in drug repurposing from all of the known diseases. But these diseases are not of interest because they already have treatment. Um, we, we, we want to, we're, we're more excited for diseases that have no treatment or has no uh, molecular understanding. Right? So that's the real diseases. But how do we learn from the others, known information about known diseases and to do out of distribution learning uh, for real diseases with only a few data available, right? Because real, real diseases don't have much data. So I guess that's the kind of overall patterns um, so it's super important to tackle the auto distribution in the low data problem in, in real world uh, medicine. So, so in this part of work, I want to highlight a work on um, this out of, out of distribution and the, um, sorry, like the low data uh, regime uh, and the learning across tasks in the system biomedicine. So by system biomedicine, what I mean is like for each task, we, will, we have a graph that represent uh, some biology. So here's, a, here's an example. We have the PPI network, protein protein interaction network for, for species. And we're trying to generalize to a, to a, to a novel species. Right. So here's an example. How do we learn from zebrafish PPI network to annotate the vastly incomplete human PPI network? That's an example. And also, uh, uh, as I mentioned, like biology is very low data. So that, if we translate that to graph, that means we only have few labels in a graph. And how do we recover this, all of this missing part? Um, so that's future learning. And, 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 and the graph neural network just don't work well on a low resource constraint. Because if you think of it, this low, this message passing scheme um, is very, very constrained here. Like if we pass information here, since there's not much label signal, uh, it's because it's, it's extremely sparse compared to like only 20% like semi-supervised learning. It's like only few labels available. So there's no good signals to 
propagate the information. So now the natural question is, how do we adapt to a never before seen graph or label set with only a few labels available? So we formulate three types of graph meta learning problems. Um, and here's uh, also an example. So the first one is single graph and disjoint labels. Basically, we have a one single graph, but we have different set of label to, to, to look at. So in the meta training, we have uh, a set of label set um, and, uh, and then we learn from that. And then in the meta testing, we're looking at a new unseen label set. So th this example will be, we have a human PPI network but we have different sets of annotation for each of the protein. And in the meta training, we have uh, annotations about the structure of the protein. And the testing, maybe we're looking at uh, some new annotation about some, you know, if the protein has this, has, has that functions. So, if we, uh, so the question would be, if we can leverage this kind of uh, inductive bias by uh, learning from the structure, if we can inform the prediction on the functions. Right? So to be more uh, concrete, so in the meta training, here is an example of two two shot learning. Uh, if we have uh, the label size is three, basically for each task we'll have uh, the same. Um, uh, for each task we have we have one label set, but across tasks they have different uh, label set, and uh, they all come from the single graph in this setting. And the meta testing um, will have a totally the novel label set that we want to generalize to. And then the second is a uh, multiple graph and shear label setting. Basically, we have uh, lots of graphs and then we have the, uh, a shear set of labels. So, so this example would be, we only have one set of annotation that we are going to look at, but we have labels for mouse, for zebrafish, for bat PPI, and, but we want to annotate human PPI given a few labels available, right? So, so here's a more concrete example. So for each task, they all share the, the same label set, but they're coming from different graph. And we're interested in the testing graph. How do we learn from a few, few data points in the support set to generalize well to the query set performance? And the uh, uh, graph meta learning problem three is the multiple graph and disjoint label, which is uh, basically concatenate uh, the previous two. So the, an example would be given a tree of life and a set of annotation want to predict a new set of annotations for, for, for a new graph with, with new labels. So here's a more concrete example. And uh, for each task, you see they're coming from different label set and they are also coming from different graphs. So after formulating this uh, three kind of distinct problem, we want to propose a simple, effective um, approach that can work across these three problems. So we call this GMeta. The, the basic intuition is that for all of these uh, multiple graphs, we will extract some, some subgraph around each node to represent all the information for this node. So this assumption is like local hypothesis assumption, uh, but, it, but it, it will, will works well. And by subgraph, I mean, it can be any formulation of subgraph. It can be uh, multi, like random works, it can be, um, two hops, three hop neighbor. It can also be some ad adaptive way, but we want to highlight that this is, uh, one that we want to extract out, like explicit, explicitly extract a local subgraph um, for each of the node that we're going to uh, support uh, in, a, in, a, in a support set and a query set. And then we will construct uh, each, or each of these tasks. Then we fed into a graph neural network. Uh, any graph neural network is, is it's, it's good, so we're not restricting to any uh, simple, uh, so sorry, like uh, any graph neural network formulation. And then we will, grab, uh, we will get some representation about the subgraph uh, for, for each node. And then in the, in the support set subgraph, we will then compute the prototypes for each of the labels in the label set. Because if for the support set, we, will, we, we have label information. So we can compute the uh, prototypes for that for each of the label, and then ca calculate the distance with the support set prototypes and uh, the query set subgraph representation, such that uh, we will give a label um, for the uh, for the for the query set that, that is the closest to the pro prototype. So this, this is the, the prototypical learning on the subgraph representation. 
And then we also, uh, after we calculate loss, we also uh, to um, pro propagate the loss uh, about, about the, how good is the initialization of the graph neural network um, to generalize to, to, this, to this given task in a few st time steps. So, so this loss measures that. And, and if we mitigate that loss, we basically encourage the, the initialization of the graph neural network to be, um, to be good at generalizing to a task in a few, few time steps. So basically this is the memo formulation. So the, there's some attractive property of this uh, framework. The first is inductive, because as I thought, talked about in the, in, the, um, in the introduction, since there are only few labels in the graph, the typical message passing is just not pass enough uh, information um, to, to get a good representation for each node. So we will need to leverage some um, additional source of information, which we have is in the support set label. So we just le leverage the prototypical learning aspect to calculate the similarities among the each, uh, every query set of subgraph um, to the to the to the support set uh, prototypes. And also, GMAT is scalable because uh, imagine we have like one thousand graphs with mil uh, with millions of nodes, but but we're doing three way three shots task. The typical uh, graph neural network message passing would compute every then and just e extract each of it. But since we're only interested in three way three shots, and we explicitly extract each single like local subgraph around this node, we're not limited by the size of the graph or number of graph. We're only limited by the k way k uh, n shots uh, numbers of graphs. So it's so it's very scalable. It can scale scale to any kind of graphs. And, and uh, because we're you representing each node as a subgraph, we're breaking the dependency about graph. You can always almost think of it as like the classic image in the in the in, in the metal in the, in the traditional meta learning setting, right? Each point is like an image because there's no we assume there's no dependency among among, among all of these nodes. So 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 this enables us to generalize to uh, the all the three uh, settings that that that, that, that I talked about before. It also generalized to link prediction. Uh, basically, we have um, we can just extract the local subgraph around the, these two nodes to predict if there's a link. So some experimental result, uh, we show that our model is able to achieve great performance across all three graph metalling problems across node and link prediction, and that these are some of them are uh, bio bio data set like tissue PPI, where we try to an annotate a new tissues. Um, uh, and a new tissues uh, functions. And this, this is like a fold PPI we were trying to annotate a new tissues, uh, like a new set of uh, structure. And uh, so, yeah, we compare to several baselines and, and also compare to several variants of the, of the meta learning approach. And uh, we are able to achieve up to 29.9% of our previous work. And it also scaled to large graphs. So this tree of life graph, we have around 2,000, um, 2000 graphs in them. So it's super scalable. Okay, so that's the um, the low data and cross contact system biomedicine um, part. And next I'll talk about um, how do we generate an actionable hypothesis. So, pre, pre, uh, so majority of current work focused on making machine learning predictions. However, Prediction score itself is not useful for domain scientists. If you throw a, a list of prediction score to domain scientists, they will not kind of you know trust them, right? There's no there's no way to trust. So so besides um, you know these uncertainty scores and, and things like that, I think it's it's more important to generate domain scientists understandable um, um, like 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 trust. So 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 I think. It's good to generate this actionable hypothesis about why the model is, make, is making prediction, basically the, the whole explainability field. So in, so, so in some, um, so in essence, a hypothesis is basically a DAG of, um, can be thought of as like DAG, DAG of concept. And the, in our work, we can kind of simplify to represent it as a sparse subgraph of biological knowledge graph. And if we can identify, uh, so if we can ground it a prediction by, Biological knowledge graph, a subgraph of biological knowledge graph, and we can just use it as a as some hypothesis. So, so, so this work is a, a step towards that. 
So basically, uh, for any type of dynamical uh, relations, like for example, here we test the drug interaction prediction, we basically map them to the knowledge graph. And then we extract out a subgraph around these two nodes. And then we do a summarization. Uh, what we mean by summarization, we take we have a self potential module that takes the only take the initialized embedding for each node, and then ask if an edge should be dropped. So, so you can see that. Uh, so, and, and also we we, we encourage um, edges uh, like more edges to be dropped in a, in, a, in a specific local subgraph. And then the way we do it is by and calculating a, a self-attention score. So every edge is giving information. I'm so sorry. So every node is giving information from all the other nodes in the local subgraph. And we want to predict if these, after we get the node, uh, the, the, the node embedding, we'll just uh, concatenate and then fit that into a, uh, an MLP to predict if the edge should be dropped. So note that the difference between this and the, the other, other graph XAI uh, work is that this is a during training process. So it's not a post training process. So the uh, message passing only operate on the uh, masked um, edges. So the only reasoning information is from this very sparse subgraph that we that we use. Such that, so such that the model is only looking at this sparse subgraph. So we can say that this could be used as some form of hypothesis that model is, is, is using. And, and so after we, 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 fed, we feed into a, uh, some neural encoding module, we get the representation and then we can just predict the, 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 the relation type. So here's some uh, statistics. Um, we're able to uh, achieve pretty good performance across uh, a wide range of uh, baselines and across data, data, data sets. And uh, we also uh, come, uh, did some ab ablations. If we minus the cage, you can see the performance decreased pretty substantially. And, and uh, the micro F1 is, is more interesting because we look at multiple, uh, we have 80 uh, DDI drug uh, drug interaction types here. And uh, there are some, and it's highly imbalanced. There are some um, uh, drug, drug interaction that is, has very low number, but these are the challenging cases. And the micro F1 does not really reflect that. So the, that this micro F1 uh, reflects that. And I also uh, did some very, very variant of, you know, if we reduce summarization module, so it, so it's act, it actually reduced some noise in the, in the bi biological knowledge graph, because this is better uh, after the, uh, we have a sparse version of the uh, local subgraph. And also we, we test if we can remove some of the chemical fingerprints and uh, it, can, it also improve performance. And here's a case study um, of, of the of um, of the sum gene. And basically, we, we get these two drugs, and then we extract the local subgraph, and then we feed it into the model, and it flags all of these edges to be not important. And then we look for the uh, literature evidence, and we find that these two drugs connect to um, these two side 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 effects nodes. And uh, it is um, in the in the literature we find evidence that this two side effect has relation with the central nervous system activities. So if these two nodes are both connected to this side effect, then the model is leveraging this information to make the prediction. Uh, so, so 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 this is this is an example of uh, generating some actionable hypothesis. And uh, so. Okay, so we, now we have some um, graph explainability and the, the natural question becomes, how do we then further give this information to domain scientists? So that is the kind of the problem of presentation of a machine learning prediction. Because we, uh, for a given machine learning prediction, we can present in uh, multiple ways. Uh, this is especially the case for, for, for graph neural network, for, uh, for graph XAI, right? If, you know, so how do we present this um, view of very complex objects such that domain scientists can uh, easily digest it? So we go. So we went to investigate this problem about graph XAI. Uh, so in collaboration uh, with with Niels Gillenberg, um, 
lab who is focused on biological visualization, which we try to investigate what does what are some of the presentations uh, of a of a of a graph, graph neural network and um, explainability method. So here we pose three variants. The first, so uh, also a bit of context. So we, here we're doing uh, drug treatment prediction. So we have a drug, we have a we have a sorry, we have drug, we have a treatment, and want to predict if if the drug can treat this treatment. So the first, the most natural uh, kind of presentation would be the neighborhood nodes view. For so for each um, node, we, we extract a, a important local neighborhood, and then we just uh, so this will be used as a uh, presentation. And another is the one as I showed in some gen that is a subgraph view, but it's still pretty complex. It's very hard to um, to quickly know what is the mechanism. And the last view is, is what we propose is trying to represent this as a meta path. So basically, uh, that is the, this is also how kind of domain scientists uh, makes um, uh, justification for drug and disease, right? They're trying to find um, some linear, some path from a drug to the disease in the biological KG. And a path information, like a sequence, sequential path is much easier than very complex graph objects. We just clean them out. And then we we just rank each of these paths by, by the uh, explainability score assigned to each edge by from the machine learning model. And we just uh, give the top ranked path to the um, scientist. And, uh, and, uh, and this is ongoing work, but, we, but I can show that to you guys that I can tell, tell, tell you guys that we, 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 we conduct some user studies with, with uh, around uh, 10 uh, physicians and ask to them uh, some users, uh, some it's kind of explainability question about what, what is the best presentation. And also, um, uh, basically, we, we, we design a user, user study to investigate what, what is the best presentation of, of graph, graph XAI. And also, without any of the justification, just the prediction score. And we find that this presentation can dramatically improve the um, trust of the domain scientists. So this is just highlight that it is super important um, to think about how do we present a machine learning prediction. And another example in the HCI space is um, is we so we investigate the problem on HCI for 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 lead optimization. So basically, we have a molecule. And uh, in the lead optimization, we want to make sure the molecule has some high binding affinity to the target. And in the meantime, we want to optimize the molecule to improve the drug likeness. So the motivation is that we know that machine learning is very good for prediction, but it's, not, but it's still not good enough for very, very large number of objective generation and optimization. But human it's not good for multiple objective prediction. Basically, we have make some modification on, on the drug. We want to know all of these different uh, ADME properties. We don't we, we don't know that, but it, it has lots of uh, domain knowledge about how to optimize a molecule for some. Uh, you know, if you want to improve some toxicity, we know that you know this sub, this functional group is is not useful. So we want to um, somehow um, based on this domain prior, we want to optimize that molecule based on that. So, 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 so in this work, we, we are asking if we can combine them. That is, let humans do design guided by the machine learning prediction. So basically, we make this um, um, in, in the interface, feed in the target amino acid sequence, and you can draw um, molecules uh, from on, on this panel. And you can click submit within around like one second. It will give you predictions of machine learning model for all of these um, property, ADN properties and also binding affinities. Okay, and then domain scientists can okay find this. For example, this toxicity is, is looks weird, and then maybe this is this functional group is making this uh, toxicity higher. So we want to modify this functional group, and 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 and, and then just reiterate um, such, such such that it can um, optimize this this molecule to make sure every property is good. And also the binding affinity is also kept the same. <clears throat> and, and, and the future work would be um, by using um, some generative model 
to do this auto fill of the lead optimization, right? Like if, if we can make suggestion of, of uh, based on this per, per prediction score, which can be served as like some oracles, and uh, it, it based on these scores, we uh, generate some potential clues for how to improve it. And the chemical science, the chemist, the chemist can can filter if, if this is good or not, right? And and so so this is like a more like an, another another next step to enable HCI. And another in, interesting thing is this auto field can also be served as new data points to show whether machine learning suggestions matches this chemical motivation, right? Because if, if chemists say this suggestion is bad, they will not use it. They will draw their own chemist. Uh, they, they will join their own functional group. So this will be a negative example, and this will be a positive example to further improve the model. So this becomes a positive feedback loop. So cool. So so that is uh, this, that summarizes the part on the interface with domain scientists. So next, I'll talk about some uh, challenges in the infrastructures in Therapeutic ML, that is data set and benchmarks. So I want to highlight our, our recent work on TDC, um, that is a machine learning data set that task for drug discovery and development. So this joint work done with Tian Fan, Wen Hao, and Yue Joseph, along with our advisors. So basically, the motivation here is that we know that therapeutics are very exciting, and, but the thing is, data set is usually of many different types, and it's very hard for machine learning scientists who have limited training in biomedicine to identify, process, and curate this data set, which requires domain expertise. And also, the data sets are scattered around the biorepository, and there's no centralized uh, repository for a variety of therapeutics. And also, the um, how do we validate this model in the real world requires some special splits and the evaluation schemes um, and that can really show uh, a fair and robust um, manner that mimics the real world deployment. So, so motivated by these challenges, we propose a TEC. And uh, here's uh, all the, the links. Basically, this is trying to provide a framework to systematically access and evaluate machine learning across the entire, the entire range of therapeutics. So here's a highlight. So across the life cycle of therapeutic machine learning, we're trying to, to, to help. Um, so first is formulating machine, meaningful machine learning tasks. We, we, so we outsource lots of learning tasks from domain scientists. And uh, so now we have 22 learning tasks across a wide range of um, uh, bio, uh, therapeutic domain and also a, a wide range of Therapeutic pipelines, and then for after we have learning tasks, we're well, trying to retrieve and harmonize and curate data sets. So for that, we curate around sixty six machine learning ready data sets uh, that has around sixteen million data points, and they are all machine learning ready in a sense of the, the in the fav favorite uh, machine learning research favorite uh, pandas format, and then um, it covers a wide range of biomedical um, en entities from compounds, gene, antigene. Uh, guided RNAs, reactions, and, and, and so on. And after we have this data set, we want to design, develop, and train machine learning models. So we provide, uh, so we don't have model itself, but we provide lots of uh, support functions like, like data splits, model generation oracles, and uh, data processing helpers. And then we also provide lots of evaluator functions uh, to realistically evaluate um, the performance. And then we host a set of leaderboards um, curated from all of these uh, data set and, and, and functions. So, so TDC is, is designed to be easy to use. So here's a demo. Uh, we only use a kind of three lines of code. You can retrieve a wide range of uh, data set. Right, here's to want to retrieve the CACO uh, data, data, um, data set from the ADM task from a single part um, machine learning problem. So you can see so use three lines of code, you can get it. And then we also have like, all, all, all of these data functions are very easy to retrieve as well. Um, so here's an example to use molecule generation oracles. So we gather 17 um, oracles that, that, that is super uh, that's, that's re re realistic and also, um, and for example, like some docking scores, some like synthetability scores, and, and also uh, like uh, some target. So, 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 so all of these docking oracles can be accessed using three lines of code. You just specify the oracle name and feed in the smiley string and you will get the score. And, and next I want to highlight uh, some uh, 
benchmarks work that, that, that are in the TDC. Uh, for uh, what kind, how, how many minutes do I have? Um, do you still have a lot more to present? I think around five minutes. Um, yeah, maybe we can ask the, the audience if they, they want to jump in with some, some question before, like, and if there's, there's not that much question, then okay. we, can, we can finish. Um, okay. So, um, does anyone in the audience have any, any question about what has been presented so far? If so, just unmute yourself and, and ask a question. Um, okay, no one is asking anything. Uh, I, okay. I have a question about, um, I have a, yeah. a few questions. Uh, going back to the sub GNNs, uh, when you were predicting uh, drug drug interaction, I, I was wondering what type of split do you, uh, did you do to, for, for those results? Because like, have you seen any of the drug in the test set that you used to present those results during training? Uh, you see only new pair of drug, uh, like how does it work? What does it split? Yeah, I think so, so, so in this work, we're not uh, constructing, we're not using any like code split, we're only using this random split. So we only shuffle the drug pairs so that the testing drug pairs will not be seen in the in the training drug pairs. But 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 uh, but as you say, I think it's more realistic to 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 tackle like if we can um, in a test set have some um, drugs that we have never seen before. Uh, I think that would, that'll be potentially more realistic. Um, yeah, I think there's kind of uh, two le three level of difficulty: the random split. And the second level of difficulty is having drug that you have never seen before, uh, and you predict the interaction with a drug that is in the training set. And the hardest level of difficulty is having two drugs that you have never seen before in the training set validation set. Then you try to predict the, mm -hmm. the interaction. And like for this model to be developed in, in the wild, like as you said, uh, we actually need to move a bit toward this, uh, yeah, those two levels of difficulties. Uh, a question from Loon is, do you have any insight into data canonization? For example, one chemical might have multiple smiles and different database use different algorithms for generating canonical smiles. So it's any like, insight so, so for TDC, we are just using the RDKIT um, can canonical smiley string. But as you said, um, as, like a compound can be generated with multiple versions of smileys. And uh, I mean, there, there, there are some works on uh, to use it as like some data or augmentation scheme, or like even to map it from the input and output as different smiley formulation um, uh, to, to just to get a better representation. Um, but I think for TDC, which is basically giving you the canonicalized smiley strings. And then you can, uh, so we'll have the users to transform from themselves. Um, just piggybacking on that, uh, do you have any idea if, if TDC will at some point allow some data augmentation? Because some of the data set, uh, they are really small uh, in terms of number of sample and data augmentation mm -hmm. have been shown over and over again to improve the, the result in almost mm -hmm. all the other fields, like it's something that people do, but a bit less in in your discovery. Do you have any insight of that? Yeah, yeah. I think it will be super interesting to include some data augmentation scheme um, in the kind of as a, like data functions, right? Like, and, and I think we, we need to have an active ticket on that on that on that issue. Like, we want to, for example, as the uh, the audience just asked, like, since one molecule can generate multiple versions of smiley string, so 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 that would be served as one data augmentation um, scheme, right? But I think there are also other um, schemes. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I think we, we so we have, so in TDC we have lots of open issues that we want to include and we put them in the GitHub. So please check, check them out and, and uh, we're really excited for like new contributions and, you know, yeah. Um, any more questions? Um, 
there seem to be none. Please, you can you can continue. You we still have a few more minutes for you to end. Okay, sounds good. So so yes, yeah, so next I want to highlight some of the um, uh, benchmarks in, in in TTC, which are also like realistic um, kind of simulation of the downstream implementation. So here is the admat. Well, basically, we have we carried 20 time, uh, 22 kind of new automatic endpoint data set. So for absorption, distribution, metabolism, execution, toxicity, each we have a diverse range of endpoints that we collected from paper supplementaries and also public databases. And then we, we conduct a very systematic uh, study. So each each and yeah, so each this drug um automatic property is split using scaffold split. And we also designed different metric that kind of uh, makes best sense for each of the data set. So we compare with the expert curated method, which is the chemical fingerprint plus deep neural networks and smiley strings, and also more molecular graph based uh, methods. And we see that first, there's no single method that has the best performance across the board. Some, uh, you know, some simple, simple fingerprints can beat the state of our method. By a quite large margin on several endpoints, and also um, it's indeed like overall the pre-training help uh, is is very helpful. Uh, pre-training model yield overall the the, just the strongest um, predictors uh, across this twenty-two endpoint. So this is basically one I want to highlight that um, there's still lots of space to improve on the molecule re representation space. Um, uh, if we want to make sure a model is able to achieve across the board better performance, um, there's, there's still um, like a lot, a lot, like a long way to go. And another is drug target interaction prediction, where we um, we have a drug molecule structure, the compound I amino mean, acid sequence, want to predict the binding affinities. And the trick is um, because we know that DTI data set, uh, uh, you know, in the, in, the, in the machine learning literature, they're usually split in a random manner. But in the real world drug, drug target, they usually require generalization to novel drugs and proteins. So, so this becomes a domain generalization problem where we, in the training and validation set, we have drug targets patented in the 13 and 18, and we'll generalize to DTIs patented in the 19 to 21. So, so uh, uh, across time, the, the drug structure will be different, and also the protein of interest sequence will also be different. So, so, so for this benchmark, we're trying to fix the backbone of the D, uh, DTI network, but we, but we serve, but we use it as a, um, a test bed for domain generalization methods. So we try on different domain generalization methods. And so ERM is the standard training. <laughs> and then we try the six state of our DG uh, method. And we show that first, the out of, out of distribution performance significantly drop from the in distribution performance as expected. And also the standard training strategy actually have similar performance as the state of art domain generalization method. So this really highlights some, uh, we, we will need a, sp a specialized domain generalization method for drug target interaction prediction. And then we also want to, uh, we also have a molecule generation benchmark. Uh, basically molecule, molecule generation is aiming to generate new molecules that has a high scores assigned by some oracle functions. And um, so in this benchmark group, um, so, so, so basically we have, um, uh, so we know that the, so the, the motivation of this benchmark group is that we know that many existing methods focus on simple heuristic oracles that is able to be, uh, uh, to be re retrieved in milliseconds in IDKIT where the you know, SOTA method can you know, just come, come millions of times for that oracle. But realistically, many real world oracles are super expensive and resource intensive. For example, like, uh, you know, if you want to, uh, in, the, in the extreme case, you want to, uh, the generation oracle will be the bioassays, like bio lab experiments, then that, that is impossible to, we can, the model can call millions of times for that, right? We can only call, call very very limited number of oracles. So so this is the kind of the new uh, settings of this doc, uh, docking molecule generation benchmark. Basically, ask if we can generate molecule given a small budget. 
So to simulate that, we use docking oracles. The, the docking is a is a is 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 definitely less expensive than biosafe, but it's much much more expensive than these simple heuristics oracles. If it, it, in contrast to the simple heuristic, which takes milliseconds, docking takes minutes uh, in in Vina. So we kind of restrict the number of oracle calls that that is available for each model. And in addition to that, we're trying to evaluate it in a more uh, realistic manner. So we include lots of the classic metrics, that is top 100, top 10, top one docking scores, diversity and normality with these classic metrics. And in addition, we try to test if the molecule, generated molecule is synthetable with, uh, with our partner molecule.1. And it will also uh, include a, a metric that tests what are some of the percentage of the uh, generated molecule that pass these molecular filters. And uh, so, so the motivation with this uh, additional metric is that uh, there's some recent work showing that uh, as the molecule is generating um, very high confident docking score, like some target ta targeted values, the synthetability uh, is like decreasing significantly. And uh, so here's some result. We compare on the domain specific method, the virtual screening graph J, and also state of art method in machine learning. We find that first of all, all of the, this model fail in these challenging but realistic settings. Basically, they do not beat the best in the data, so they cannot generate um, molecules that has better docking scores. And also, uh, we find that graph GA method with zero learn learnable parameters actually perform the best. So this all of this SOTA method that reports excellent performance in you know uh, when when resource is highly uh, uh, available, it just fell in these cases. And also we observe as we, well, so here we, we limit to, to the first first row is a 1,000 number of calls, and the second row is 5,000 number of calls. We basically find the performance um, degrades significantly as the model is, has more number of calls and uh, like the like the model uh, like the molecule synthetability and the uh, percentage that uh, that pass the molecule filter just decreased significantly, meaning that um, the greater the number of calls, the worse the quality of generated molecules. So so so, so this basically highlights a specialized challenge for molecule generation realistically. And I want to highlight all of these benchmarks can be retrieved using a few lines of code in the TDC interface. Uh, you can simply uh, load TDC benchmark class, get this machine learning ready data, train your model, and return ready to submit metrics uh, in a five lines of code. And so please consider submitting your solution to our leaderboard here. Now, TDC is an open science in, in, in initiative. So here's uh, these uh, links. And uh, oh, I also highlight that we have a user group meeting um, ne next week. Um, so please, uh, if you're in interested to learn more about TDC, Feel free to uh, register at this link. Uh, so th that, that's it. Uh, uh, thank you for listening. And if you have any, any questions, um, thank you, Kishan. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so Emmanuel has one question in the chat. Maybe he wants to ask that himself. Uh, thank you, Kishan, for the talk. It was quite nice. So I have a, a few questions. So the first one is about the curation of the TDC benchmark data set. Mm -hmm. So uh, did you do any kind of additional curation because molecular data sets are known to be quite noisy or mm -hmm. where the data coming straight from the original sources? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so for the, um, for the animal production, um, we, I think the, the thing we do is we, uh, we first uh, to, to do the RDKIT canonicalization. I think that that is kind of the main thing because for, for that, if we map them to the molecule structure in the RDKIT, it will flag many like invalid smiley strings. And then we will use um, the kind of canonicalized version as in the, in the adamant, um Data set. And, and as you see, I think this noise coming from the input and also from the label, right? There's lots of uh, noise in the, in, the, in the label. 
So for that part, it's kind of very difficult to detect uh, which molecules is is bad or good. We can we can we, we see that the, the we also check the label uh, distribution. Most of them falls into a, a like a very nice um, kind of uni model uh, distribution. Um, so we, we we were thinking about if we need to remove some outliers, but that or this outlier, you know, in drug discovery, outliers sometimes just mean real signals. You know? So so we so we also don't want to do that. So so in the end, we just keep the all the labels available, and um, and uh, yeah, I, th I think that's how we uh, approach it. Thank you. Uh, my other question was about the uh, generalization, as you said a bit before. So, uh, uh, are there any plans to add to the TDC benchmark a new data set in a all different work where, for example, you, you are keeping the same kind of task itself. So if you're predicting solubility is the, the same task, but new data set that might be coming from different assay or different sources. Mm. Yeah, I, I think, yeah, we, we, we were discussing about one potential benchmark is the, like the, um, um, like the, there's a large, uh, a screening in Campbell's, you know, in, in Campbell, there's a for for each target there will be like one like, like a set of molecules that have labels, and basically you want to like each task will be a will be one bioassay, and you want to generalize to a noble bioassay that we had that we have never seen before by leveraging all the information from the known bioassays. So that could be one example of the OOD um, generalization. Um, yeah, yeah, I, I think I think this is a very um, exciting uh, direction to include in TZ benchmark, and uh, and and yeah. So we are uh, so if if you're interested, you can feel free to open the GitHub issue, and we're also more than more than happy to to work with you to um, to release that benchmark. 